yeah, uh, my name is Donovan Ebersole. Um, I am a third year graduate student at Florida State, uh, working on my uh, PhD in particle physics. Um, hopefully we'll have that done in a couple years. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey from um, Chipola uh, to here, um, to where I'm at now, um, and also the research I'm doing. So I want to talk a little bit about that journey because I think that uh, there's a couple of things that really stand out that I think are applicable to all of you guys, um, whether you go into graduate school, medical school, whatever it is. Um, and there's, there's some points that I think um, will really help you succeed um, in those point, in those uh, journey, whatever it is that you're taking. Um, and like I said, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, and the first point I want to kind of point out before I get to um, my actual talk is um, it, all of the things that I've done, there's always been a mentor there to help me get to that point. And I think it's super important that you um, really trust those people in terms of their advice um, and go, okay, well maybe um, if this person has succeeded, there's a reason they did, right? And so if I wanted to be a professor, which is what um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, that's my goal, I wanna talk to physics professors. I wanna talk to people that have gotten to that point. Um, if I wanna be a doctor, I wanna talk to doctors, right? There is, um, these people have gone through and they know um, they've done the, the work to, to do so, so um, you should really take, uh, take um, listen to what they have to say. Um, so that's the first thing I wanna mention. The second thing is uh, when opportunities arise, uh, take them. Um, there's going to be some times where uh, you're not going to know uh, why um, something has, has came up, but um, you get to realize that once you get through it, you go, I'm so glad I did that. It has brought um, opportunity, um, kind of builds on itself, right? And you're going to see uh, things that came up that um, I never would have had uh, a chance to do um, if it wasn't for uh, a couple of opportunities that some were given to me, but some I had to kind of work for. Uh, I had to ask people, I had to figure it out. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is my time at Chipola. Um, and so uh, you can't really see all of this, but this is uh, Maxwell's equations. If you guys are in physics too, you might have seen these. Um, the reason I bring this up is because there's a reason I chose physics. When I got out of high school um, in 2015, I was going to be an engineer. That was my goal. Um, I knew I was good at math and I wanted to make money. So yeah, engineering is probably the way to go. Um, and so that's what I chose, right? Uh, but something had to switch. Obviously, I'm not in engineering right now, so what, what was that change? Um, and that change was really uh, boat arts class, sitting in, listening about uh, Maxwell's equations. I was in calc-based physics, so we talk, we go a little bit more in depth into the, where these guys come from. Um, and I realized something very important. It wasn't actually math that I liked, it was the application of math that I really liked. I really liked using math as almost a language to describe things. And that's exactly what um, Maxwell's equations are. So obviously these are equations, just like you would see in math. Um, but all these symbols mean something, right? Um, electric field, that's the E, B is the magnetic fields, um, Q is charge, all these things are physical objects for the most part. Um, some of these are constants, so they're not super physical, but they're really, really um, applicable to things that you have seen. And what's really crazy about these equations in particular is um, you probably haven't never seen them <laughs> in terms of uh, electric fields and magnetic fields are not something you just kind of walk around and look at, right? Like you might see a ball rolling down a hill and go, oh, I, there's physics applied there somewhere. But um, electric fields and magnetic fields have, um, you don't really see them, but you know you use all kinds of stuff that w uses them, right? Your computers, your phones, um, even your cars um, work off of Faraday's law, which is uh, this one, no, this one right here, right? Um, the reason that your alternator, you have an alternator in your car, that's essentially Faraday's law. All of that stuff is super interesting and really, really applicable. And I was like, okay, that's actually what I like. Um, and so I chose, I was like, okay, I, um, I actually want to study further along in this. I want to go a little bit further, see what's going to happen. I didn't know what I was going to do in terms of physics. I knew that's what I want go, um, to go into, but I had no idea how I was going to use it. Um, it's not exactly like you go into engineering, you know you could be an engineer out of it, right? Like that's, that was obvious, right? If I want to go to medical school, if I get out of medical school, I'm going to be a doctor. Um, but a degree in physics wasn't exactly obvious what I was going to do with it. Um, and so I had to, um, there's a couple other things that happened during that time that really helped me figure out what I wanted to do with it. Um, and so and he said I was a part of the honors program, I was. Um, and so in the honors program, you get to do a project in a, a course that you're taking. Um, so I, I did physics. Um, so I got to really go further in depth into the physics subject, further than what we did in class. Um, we actually got to do um, a couple projects in physics one. I did a project on um, a rocket. Uh, we built a, a rocket engine. 
um, and was super interesting. We didn't actually cover rockets in, uh, in the class, and so it was something I got to go a little further along in. Um, it was using the same principles, forces, acceleration, stuff like that. Um, but I got to um, learn things like terminal velocity, uh, some very interesting stuff further along. In the, in, there were physics, um, but further along than what I covered in class. I also got to build something, so that was cool. Um, and then uh, the second semester, my, my wife is actually, um, she was really interested in biology, and so she wanted to do neuroscience, um, and we did the physics of neuroscience, which was really quite interesting. Um, there's actually uh, a lot of physics going on in your body, and you don't really realize that, um, and in biology in general. Um, and so in neuroscience in particular, we can actually kind of describe how neurons work in your body as circuits. Um, and so it's really interesting, very fascinating, uh, field, it's really now a whole field of research um, and how physics applies to neuroscience. And uh, it was an opportunity that I got to do. Um, and so I was, I was able to go further um, than what we did in class. And this was the beginning of what um, now I do is research, right? This was the start of research um, that I was doing. And so um, this was a huge opportunity. Um, so Ms. Bonnie was a big uh, per person that helped me um, kind of figure out what I wanted to do um, in terms of that. Um, and it was also because of the honors program that I got to be an ACE tutor as well. Um, and so the reason I bring the um, ACE lab up is because I told you I didn't know what I wanted to do with physics until I started tutoring and I realized, oh, I actually like teaching people. Um, so <laughs> I got into the honors program when you first start. Um, they sign up for classes and you get over in the summer and you go talk um, to the honors coordinator. And at the time, that was Miss Bonnie. And she was like, hey, um, I have an opening at the ACE if you want to be a tutor. And I was like, I'd never been a tutor in my life. Let me clarify this. Um, I had helped people, like, like, hey, um, can you help me understand why A plus B equals C? Like, yeah, I can do that. Um, but I didn't actually tutor, and I definitely didn't get paid for the tutoring. So I had no idea what I was doing. And um, <laughs> luckily, uh, Ms. Bonnie trusted me, um, and it was, a, it was a good time. But it was because of that, um, I had an opportunity. She was like, hey, would you like it? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll take it. Um, not sure how this is going to go, but sure, why not? And so I did. Um, and it was because of this that um, a couple really important things came out of the ACE lab. One, I chose my career. I wanted to go. I wanted to teach. I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to actually not just know physics. I wanted to teach physics. I wanted to share that knowledge with other people. Um, but the second thing is, uh, I actually met my wife in the ACE lab. Um, well, now my wife. Uh, so <laughs> at the time, um, it was uh, actually the very first time I ever stepped on campus um, and went into the ACE lab. Um, it was the first time I ever met her. So pretty important um, in terms of my personal life. So it's definitely very helpful. Um, but it, it was here also, I made some really good friends. Um, and between all, the, all three of these things, um, me and my, my wife now, uh, Madeline, decided to do um, something called Science Day. Um, and it was because um, we both found a love for science, m mine and physics, hers in neuroscience and um, pretty much in anything that's science related. Um, and uh, because of some of the projects we did in the honors program, and because I knew I wanted to teach, um, I wanted to share that love of science with other people. So we did Science Day the first time we did it in 2016. Uh, so this is uh, my wife at the time. This is me, a couple of students from Bluntstown, actually. Um, and we're explaining our honors project. Um, and so what we did is we brought students in. Um, these honors projects, um, quite a few of them were in physics. And so um, almost all of them were in sciences. Not all of them, but most of them were. And so we actually got to show what we did in that class with these students and go, hey, this is actual science being done by students that weren't required to do it. <laughs> um, and so I think that's uh, something that was really important. Um, they got to do experiments. We fed them, which is an important reason for people to go places is if you feed them, they will go. Um, and I've learned that more in graduate school than, than anywhere else. Um, and so it was really fun. I enjoyed it. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because uh, this actually had given me some opportunities to do later. This was not something required of me or Madeline, my wife. Um, it wasn't required uh, by the science club. In fact, um, it was kind of like, you sure you guys want to do this? OK, let's try it. Um, and so we did. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is because uh, we both had a love for science that we wanted to share. Um, and it was something that we didn't do it because of, and you're going to see, um, we got some awards from it. But that wasn't the reason we did it. We just had fun. And um, we had an opportunity. And we had some uh, money lying around from the science club that we could use. And so we're like, sure, let's do this. We had some connections. We knew people. and so. Uh, we got some professionals to come down and talk to students um, that were in different fields, engineering, uh, doctors, pharmacists, all different types. 
We had some universities come down and talk to students. And so it was really cool that I got to actually, um, we got to take those connections and put it into something. Um, and again, uh, so because of that, uh, we got some, uh, some interesting things. Um, so this, uh, yeah, me and Bodart, just because I was the science club president, right? Uh, got a little award there. Um, but I was also part of Phi Theta Kappa. And in fact, I think they just had a ceremony or a uh, press conference today uh, of people getting on the wall here. Um, and the way we did that is through these scholarships that Phi Theta Kappa does. Well, um, the reason, uh, if you guys go into Building Z, my face is on the wall, the reason is, is because a lot of it was because of Science Day. Um, both me and my wife did a lot uh, for that. Um, and so when we applied, um, I guess other people thought it was interesting as well. And so uh, they, yeah, I got a couple of um, national awards from that. Um, in fact, this, uh, this is me with Governor Rick Scott at the time. We, um, he, uh, he got, had his, a uh, Champion of Service Award, or he did. Um, and uh, they had given it me, to me for the month of November, I think. I don't remember exactly which month. But um, yeah, so I was one of only two people in the state that had gotten it um, that month. Um, it was pretty cool. Got to go to the governor's mansion, got free food. So main reason I went. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, so I did Mu Alpha Theta, I did Science Club. We did a lot of stuff. Um, really enjoyed my Brain Bowl time. It's one of the best, some of the best memories I have at Chipola is Ace Lab and Brain Bowl. And so um, it was also because of that, I think, um, that uh, I also got the award as well. It's, I was a part of a group that um, did things and it wasn't required of us. In fact, most of us, we just kind of do it for fun. And so it was um, something that was, uh, it, it looks good. But um, again, I enjoyed it. And definitely some of the best trips I've had in my life. <laughs> going to Chicago, going to Atlanta a couple of times. It was a lot of fun, all the different tournaments. So um, I got done at Chipola. What did I decide to do? I knew I wanted to go in physics, um, but I didn't know where. And so I was looking around, got, uh, Troy came up. And so why did I choose Troy University for my undergrad? Uh, well, one, they had my major. Um, that's an important reason to go. Um, and so in fact, I, I enjoy, like I told you, I enjoyed physics, but I did enjoy math actually, um, and going further in depth into it. And math and physics are like one and the same. If you've ever taken a physics class, it's almost gonna feel like a math class. Um, there's a lot of overlap between these. Um, in fact, a lot of the physics, or a lot of the math that you um, learn in calculus was all mostly developed, um, the older stuff by uh, physicists. Um, calculus was developed by Isaac Newton, was a very famous physicist. Um, the, the equations I put on the board before are calculus three, uh, vector calculus, those are um, very important ideas. And so they go hand in hand, so that's why I chose that. So this is, my, this is the department in, in physics at uh, Troy University. Um, these are all the juniors and seniors at the time um, taking this class. It's not very big, right? It was super nice, right? This is, uh, there's only, um, at, now there's three professors, but um, at the time there was only two. This is Dr. Govan Menon, um, definitely one of my favorite professors at Troy, um, and then another Dr. James Sanders. Um, I, only, I knew all of the department by talking to two people, right? Like that is really nice. You get to know everyone. I knew who was gonna teach my classes. I wasn't worried about that. Uh, if I needed, if I had an issue, I could actually show up now and like they would be there in their office. Um, as someone who is now at FSU, that's a lot more difficult than you would think at a university um, just to, to have them present. Um, and so uh, they, these were, they, they love to teach for the most part. They were really working on helping us learn. And so it was definitely a huge foundation into why um, I succeed, I'm succeeding now in graduate school. Um, so yeah, I love the smaller size of the department. These are all the juniors and seniors. There's a, there's, actually, this was one of the largest classes um, that had gone through. So this is you know, you know f like 15 people, or something like that. Um, and it's a big, big group. And so um, yeah, I really like that. And of course, scholarships. So Troy University has some pretty good scholarships. They're more uh, tuition-wise, they're on the expensive side, uh, but they have some really good ones. Uh, and in fact, I got one that um, paid my way through. So uh, I got full tuition, room and board, and a meal plan. It's hard to turn that down. So another reason I went, <laughs> again, when opportunities arise, take them. Uh, and so it, that was a big part of it. Um, yeah, this is actually our relativity class. You can kind of see the work on the back. So general relativity, that's what this is. Um, and so while I was at Troy, I did some research. Um, I knew that I want to be a professor. To be a professor, you have to have a graduate degree. And in physics, most of the time, that's a PhD. And, uh, and to get a PhD in physics, you have to do research. It's required, like, that's what you're going to do. And so I needed some research under my belt before I got to um, graduate school, um, so that way I get accepted into graduate school. So I did some work at, uh, with Dr. James Sanders, um, who does a lot of uh, work in uh, physics education. Um, he does a lot of uh, different um, 
lab tech, he makes different labs that you can use um, in different uh, course undergraduate level courses um, to help learn some concepts. And so we did one uh, where we were measuring viscosity of fluids uh, through a damped harmonic oscillator, which I'll explain what all of those things are. Um, so viscosity just means how thick a fluid is. Uh, something like water is very thin, um, it flows easily. Something like molasses or glycerin is very thick. It flows, it takes forever to flow, right, uh, for it to move. And so, um, and then this harmonic oscillators are super important in the world of physics. Like, we know very few things, and one of them is harmonic oscillators. Um, and it comes up in every class I've ever taken since I was an undergrad, and all graduate courses, harmonic oscillators come up. And what they are are things that move, they, they oscillate. So like, uh, so this is a very popular one, um, a weight on the end of a spring. You pull that weight down, it's just going to bob up and down for like ever, all right? Um, and then, yeah, pendulums is another big one. Um, but these are really important concepts, and that was the main reason we did this lab, is it's two um, important concepts. Viscosity of fluids is really important in fluid dynamics, and the damped harmonic oscillator is important in all of physics. So between those two things, um, they come up a lot. And so we wanted to teach, have a lab um, that can teach both of those. And uh, if you know anything, if, you're, if you've ever taught a class, your biggest commodity is time. You always never have enough time to do anything. So if you can do two things at once, you're doing well. Um, and so we were two different um, pretty important concepts that you could teach in one lab. And so that's what we did. Um, I'm not going to go too much into what we did. Uh, this is a force uh, sensor. You might have seen it if you've taken uh, physics in your lab. Connected to a spring, which is connected to a weight, and it bobs up and down. Well, if you put that weight then into a fluid, um, it slows down, right? So that, um, in that progression of how slow it goes, it's actually exponential decay. Um, how, how, um, the less it um, oscillates, it actually um, determines the viscosity of that fluid. So obviously something that's thicker, it's going to um, slow it down quicker. And so you can actually determine the viscosity of the fluid based off of that. Um, and this, actually, this lab hadn't been done um, in any of the research we looked at. So it was actually really cool, um, something that we could, it could do. Um, so this is me giving the presentation. This is actually at Troy. Um, but I'm going to talk about, a, I gave a few presentations while I was at, um, at Troy. And I'll talk about those in just a second. So the other important thing that I did at Troy that I really, really um, am very grateful for, something called LSAMP, um, Louis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. Um, they just want to, they want to get uh, underrepresented groups into graduate and undergraduate uh, degrees in STEM. And so um, they had literally just, op uh, just started the program when I got to Troy. Um, like they didn't have anybody in the program and we're like, hey, we need someone here. Do you want to join? I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Um, fine, <laughs> fine with me. Um, and it was really cool. Uh, I had um, a lot of opportunities came up because of it that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, one thing I want to notice is that this is, uh, this is NSF, if you know what that is, National Science Foundation. This is what fun funds most of the research done in science. Um, and so they funded this LSAMP program. And the reason that's important is if I'm doing research now and I'm, in the, I'm already in their system, it's very helpful to get grants and to get fellowships and to get stuff. Um, once someone, once you, they know your name, it's very, very, a lot easier to get um, things, right? Uh, make connections, very important part of it. And so um, this is a really, really uh, cool opportunity. Uh, we got to do a lot of different things. They paid for some research that I did. Um, that uh, the research that I talked about before, they actually um, paid for uh, a summer um, research uh, opportunity that I got to go to. Um, I was also the peer tutor for the program. And so there was like, uh, I think 15 students in the program. I tutored them in math, physics, and some, um, Chem 1 and Chem 2 um, for all of them. Uh, but what was really nice is I got paid to do that. But I, I got paid um, by salary. And if you know what that means, it means that I didn't have to actually work to get paid, which was very handy when there was very busy and students didn't need, actually need any help. Um, and so uh, if there was no one that needed help that week and there was no tests, um, I still got paid, and that was very helpful. <laughs> um, I didn't mean I didn't have to work. Um, in a, I'd worked before I got into the program. I'd worked fast food um, at Chick Fil A, and that was a little rough working there and going to um, school. So I definitely understand if you're doing that. That is, it's not easy. Um, I was working almost full time, and so being able to not have to do that um, and work in something that I actually care about teaching uh, was very nice. And so uh, I was funded, again, I was explaining this before, I was funded um, to do research over the summer. Um, I was actually paid to do that uh, with the, the research group at Troy. So I got to stay in Troy 
uh, working with the same professor, um, get um, some valuable research done. Um, that got to the point where I was able to actually present, um, and they funded my way to present at six different conferences. Um, so two at Troy, uh, two at uh, the Tuskegee, um, at Tuskegee University, it's the uh, statewide LSAMP meeting, and then one at um, the Alabama Academy of Sciences, and one at the um, American Physical Society's March meeting, and that was in Boston. Um, all of these were free for me. So I got to go, they paid my way through them. Um, it was very nice to get to go on a trip. And so to give you kind of an idea about conferences, um, conferences usually 10, uh, so like uh, the, actually the APS March meeting is a huge conference, got like over 100,000 people in it, um, at it, and it's, it's massive. Um, like I think they have over 1,000 speakers, it's huge. Um, actually even more than that, maybe close to 2,000 speakers. Uh, but they, uh, it's a week long, right? So you're there, um, they have talks the entire week. I only gave one talk for one hour, but I got to stay the entire week. So that meant I had five, six days in Boston for free, right? Like, that's nice. Um, so it was a lot of fun. I got to go do a, a lot of things while I was there. Um, and I even got a stipend to, to, um, while I was there to pay for food and stuff like that. So it was really, really cool. Um, I, I really liked it. Um, and that was all thanks to LSAMP. I would not have gotten that opportunity if I wasn't a part of that, of that group. Um, and so research being done at Troy, there's only two professors, so there's not a whole lot. Uh, but because of LSAMP, I was able to further that and actually go a lot further than um, what I ever expected I would do. Um, I, also, I did some other research as well in the math department and um, with actually Dr. Menon, um, the, the, guy, the professor that was in the picture before. Uh, but I, um, it, this was my main uh, research and this is what I got in graduate school um, from. So then I had to apply to graduate school. Uh, and so I list uh, some of the things. Um, applying to graduate school is very interesting. It is a uh, very, very different. Um, so both me and my wife wanted to go to graduate school, so we ended up applying to 13 different ones. That was a lot of writing. And when you apply to graduate school, every graduate school is a little bit different. And so you want to make sure your personal statement is kind of geared towards that uh, university. You can have a generic one, but the things you talk about, you definitely want to talk about uh, specific to there. Uh, so like at Florida State, I, wanted to, I didn't know what I was going to go into, so mine was more general. But um, at Northeastern, I wanted to work in the particle physics group. Um, that was the, the main one I wanted to work with. And so it was very specific um, how I wrote that. It was a lot of writing. <laughs> but it was very worth it. Um, I ended up getting accepted to these three. Uh, my wife got accepted to five because she's brilliant um, and obviously a lot smarter than I. Uh, so <laughs> she also did a lot too, so it, um, it helped. But uh, So we got a trip to all of these for free. Um, again, I, I keep bringing up free because uh, I'm broke and free is nice. Um, and so we got, I got to go, Northeastern is actually in Boston. So two weeks after I got back from March meeting, I went to Boston again <laughs> um, for three days uh, over the weekend. And it was a lot of fun. I uh, went to Baylor, um, got to hang out there for a, a few days. Uh, my wife actually got a flown out to um, LA and uh, spent um, four days in UC, at UCLA. Um, wait, she got accepted Vanderbilt, FSU. Um, the other important thing that I want to bring up is uh, graduate school is paid for um, in, in the sciences. Um, and so if you're interested in science, uh, and like I understand going to medical school is great, it really is. Um, and you get paid well afterwards. Uh, but you have to pay your way through medical school. And as someone who doesn't have a lot of money, um, I was not uh, looking into it. Um, and so I wanted to, I, I didn't know this until I was ap applying, that um, all of these, pl all the places we got accepted to and pretty much anywhere, um, you get a graduate assistantship um, and your tuition is waived, um, which means you're not paying for tuition. Um, so no debt out of graduate school. Um, you might have some from undergrads, but um, you don't have any uh, from graduate school. And you get paid uh, as either a teaching assistant or a research assistant. Um, so teaching assistants, you, you TA. Um, if you go to a bigger university, you'll, you'll be very familiar with what TAs do. Um, they do a lot of the grunt work for the professors that uh, have huge classes. So like. Uh, the class I'm teaching TAing for right now it has uh, 300 students in it, and there's three professors and 10 TAs for the class. That's a lot, um, but uh, it's yeah, um, so that's a part of what we do. Um, and then you can also be a research assistant where you focus on your research. That's what you're going to do uh, to get your PhD if that's what you're going for. Um, and so research is very important, um, and so it's very helpful. But all of these were funded uh, completely. Uh, we wouldn't have had to pay a dime. And in fact, uh, at Northeastern, I actually had a fellowship to go there, so I wouldn't have had to um, teach. I would have been able to just focus on research and probably would have gotten done um, a little quicker. Uh, but we had to figure out where we were going. Obviously, we had to make a choice. So we chose FSU. 
Um, and we chose FSU for a few different reasons. Um, so FSU actually has a really good physics research program. Um, they have 60 faculty just in physics. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's, like even, um, at, uh, so at Northeastern, they had uh, 12. At Baylor, they had uh, 15. Um, some of the, uh, UCLA has a pretty big group, but that's 60. Um, and the reason they have so many is because, um, uh, mostly because of the condensed matter, we have the National High Magnetic Field Lab. It's a very, very nice place to go. Um, really, really important in the world of um, condensed matter physics, um, which is like studying like materials and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff. Condensed matter is a massive subject, so it's big. Um, so there's nuclear physics, high energy, atomic physics, biophysics, and astrophysics. We have professors that um, work in every single one of these. Um, I chose nuclear physics, and I'll explain why in a little bit, but um, FSU, like I said, has a big program. And so I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do um, in terms of research. And because of that, I wanted to pick a place that I had a choice, and I actually had a choice here. At other places, I was having to be more specific, and um, I didn't, it wasn't always um, exactly what I wanted. So here, it gave me an, an option, gave me options. Um, it's also close to home, which is handy. I have a two-year-old now, and uh, two-year-olds um, take time, and <laughs> time I don't always have. And so having, being close to home, having family is very, very, very important. Um, so definitely something that um, I value a lot now. Um, and then I really enjoyed the faculty that I met while I was there. Um, they're very nice. Um, most of them were the ones that weren't, I didn't ever talk to again and I haven't. So it was fine. There was just one, and he's okay. Um, but all the other ones were really nice. They actually wanted me to be there. They, they asked me questions. They were interested in what I was interested in. And so it was really, really cool to talk with them. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a professor. So um, these were great people to talk to. Um, and then also this was the only school both me and my wife got into. <laughs> it, I will say this, it wasn't the, that wasn't the main reason we actually came uh, because we did have some other opportunities um, that might, uh, like um, we could have gone other places where uh, there, there was other opportunities outside of graduate school that we could have taken. So it wasn't required for us to go, uh, but it was definitely encouraged that we both got in. Um, so uh, what is graduate school like? I want to give you guys a little bit of a uh, overview. <laughs> Uh, so I put this here because uh, you get a lot of these moments where you're like, oh, I really hate this right now. And then you're like, oh, I, get I love this. I'm so glad I'm doing what I do. Um, and so you get a lot of these ups and downs, um, like a lot, most things in life. But uh, graduate school, I feel like, is a little bit more extenuated in that. You get a little bit more. The ups are up and the downs are a little down. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, your first year in graduate school is usually filled with coursework. Um, not every uh, science department. Uh, physics is definitely in that way. Um, but uh, in bio, is a little bit different. Usually, um, you focus a little bit on research a little bit earlier. Um, and same for, um, I think, chemistry, you, you start um, a little bit early as well, at least the people I've talked to. But for me, this is the way it was. I was taking six, uh, I took six courses over the two semesters, um, so three and three. And graduate courses are, they're, they can be a bear. <laughs> um, and so you can imagine one graduate course in total of work, amount of work you put in, is about two or three uh, undergraduate courses um, combined. So uh, we're doing a ton of homework. Um, and so that, that year was a little rough. I also, my wife was, uh, was pregnant at that time, and we had our son in February of that year. So that was a fun time too. <laughs> but I don't regret it. I'm really glad I did it. Um, it, it really pushed me to my uh, limits in terms of um, how much uh, I can learn at one time um, and what uh, I can, uh, it, it really showed me what I could really do. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I did it, but it was a lot of work. Year two, I finally got to do research. Yes, the thing that I'm actually going to do to get my PhD, I finally get to start. And uh, so you also, there's the qualifying exam. Um, in any graduate school, you're gonna have this. This essentially tells the university Yes, I know enough physics that I should go on to my PhD. That's essentially what it is. Um, and so for us, that is a actual written test that consists of 12 problems that we had to um, take, and you had to get so many right, and it was a lot of fun. It wasn't. Um, but I got done with it, and I'm glad I did. Uh, I'm glad it's done with. Um, and then, yeah, I finally got started on research, and now I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'm st you still take a couple of courses, but not nearly as many, and so you really get to, to kind of diversify what you're doing, um, which is really nice. And then year three and beyond, this is where I'm at now. Um, I'm pro primarily focused on research. 
I will be, um, I'm defending uh, my prospectus over the summer, which is essentially saying this is what I'm doing my dissertation on. Here it is. Um, here's my committee. Let me, uh, I, I can do it, I promise, <laughs> uh, essentially. Um, it's, it's worth doing, the research is good. Um, my, my, my goal is, um, you know, I have goals, I know this is about when I wanna finish, yada, yada. That's what the prospectus is. Um, once you get done with that, then you actually begin doing your, you, you work on actu your dissertation work, so that's um, getting enough that you can end up writing a dissertation and defending that in front of your committee, as well as um, part of your department. So that'll be, a couple years from now, probably. Um, but I, the, I have an older graduate student that's in my group that is now, he'll be defending his dissertation in uh, the fall, and so he's working on it, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I will say, you're doing this over like a two-year period, right? So you're, at, you're not just like, like, these dissertations can be long, they can be like 100 pages, but you're doing that over a long time, right? So you're adding constantly, it's not really, um, from when I talked to the dissertation, actually writing it isn't bad. Um, defend, like defending it in front of people, is a, that's, that's a, little, um, a little bit more <laughs> annoying um, because people like to ask questions that um, you don't necessarily know. <laughs> and so you have to kind of play around with it. But it, uh, it's, it, it's, um, def that's the, the next step that I'm working on. So I want to talk a little bit about my current research, what I'm doing right now. Um, so at Jefferson Labs is uh, where um, our experiment that I'm working on. Um, so I'm a particle physicist. I look at the smallest things that we know of. Um, those are, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, what that is. Um, but I did want to show you where, um, where it's at. So this is in Newport News, Virginia. Um, and so you can see this, this like, almost like a racetrack here that's underground. So this right here is underground. Um, and what this does is it moves electrons really fast, like close to the speed of light fast. Um, to the point where uh, when they hit something, they break whatever's in front of them, um, essentially. Um, and what, that's really important. Um, you can imagine um, particles are really difficult to break up. Um, you, like if you took a piece of paper and you kept, and it's easy to just rip that paper in half, right? But if you keep folding it and keep folding it, the smaller it gets, the more condensed it gets, right? The more dense it is, it gets a whole lot harder to break apart, right? So imagine really, 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 really small things. You have to get going really fast. You have to have a lot of energy to break stuff up so that way you can actually look at what's inside. Um, otherwise, they just kind of hold, hold together and uh, we got to figure out what's going on inside of them. And so that's what these, uh, these guys here. So these tubes here are what actually get it going. Um, they work similar to um, like high-speed trains. Um, they have those magnetic fields at the bottom. They get them moving really fast. That's kind of how they work. Um, electrons, so they, this is an electron beam. So they um, have electrons passing through this, this track going really fast. Um, electrons are charged, right? So they go through a magnetic field. They, um, there's some force being applied. And so um, because they're charged and they move and they move quickly. And so um, you have three halls here. That's these little like, like mounds. You um, have A, B, and C. And then hall D is down here. It's actually, this is an older picture, so it's not shown here, but it's, um, that's where it's at. It's over here. So this is hall D. Hall D is where my uh, GLUEX experiment is at, the experiment I look at. Um, and so uh, I want to talk a little bit about GLUEX. So GLUEX's goal is to study um, hadrons. Hadrons are things made of quarks, essentially. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the way we do that, um, so this is our collaboration. Uh, this is, was taken in 2019, I think. Uh, so this is actually an old picture. We didn't, so we couldn't go to Jefferson Labs during COVID. Um, it's a um, government funded lab. So um, there was a lot more restrictions on getting inside. Um, and so literally we're going to be able to go m in the end of May. So for the first time in like two years. So that's really cool. Um, but I have, uh, so a few of these guys are um, my research professor. So my research professor is, well, I don't even know where he's at. It's, yeah, you couldn't even tell. I think that's him right there. Um, yeah, there's quite a few people in that picture. So, But yeah, so this is our collaboration. It's not huge in terms of like experiments. Like some of these experiments have like thousands of people in them, um, like the LHC. Uh, so it's smaller. I know now most of these people. Um, which is really cool. And I haven't even actually met them. I just met them on Zoom. So um, it's really cool that, uh, you know, I get to make connections. Remember, that was an important part. Um, and by being a part of this collaboration. And so this experiment is what's behind them. Um, it's actually pretty big. It's like, uh, I think it's 100 feet long and like 20 feet high or something. Maybe, maybe even taller than that. I don't remember. Um, and this is the detector. 
so we have this electron beam that's produced by the, the CBAF, is what it's called at Jefferson Labs, the racetrack. Um, and it hits this diamond. And when electrons hit uh, a diamond in particular, something, um, they actually, um, they lose a little bit of energy, uh, but that energy isn't totally lost. It actually get, it gets produced in what, um, into a photon, gets produced into light. Um, and that photon we can kind of direct into um, our detector. And so um, photons are light, if you guys don't know that already. Um, they're light particles. And this process is called the Bremschlong process um, of where electron hits a diamond, produces something, um, produces a photon. And so this beam gets uh, traveled down because this is a magnetic field. Um, again, electrons are charged, so in the magnetic field they move. Um, photons are not charged, they also don't have any mass, so they, they don't move. Um, and then you, they hit this uh, target. And our target, in our case, is, a pro, um, is hydrogen. And so it is just protons, essentially. Um, they, uh, it's hydrogen liquid, um, <laughs> which is uh, very interesting um, how they get that. Um, that's, a, that's a whole other thing. Um, but yeah, so they hit it. Um, and we get these collisions of a photon and a proton hitting, and stuff comes out. And we try to study what that stuff that comes out. Um, if you guys, uh, this is. Um, just regular collisions that if you've taken physics one, it's um, what you're doing with momentum. Um, and they're really, really interesting what comes out of those. Um, and so you have uh, a whole lot of energy. Um, we're talking, so it's, the scale is kind of hard to explain, but again, these things are moving at the speed of light. They have, are really close to it. They have really, um, have a lot of uh, energy. Energy is related to velocity. Um, and so um, something, the faster something is moving, the more energy it's got. And so um, what comes out, we kind of can detect these detectors. So we have a forward calorimeter up here that um, detects things going forward. Um, <laughs> we have very basic names. So the central drift chamber, so this is central because it is central to the experiment. Um, it's on the inside. Uh, and it, it detects things right after um, it hits the target, right after the target is um, hit. And then we have the barrel calorimeter um, and then this time of flight. So all of these detectors do very different things. It um, can be a little hard to explain what all those specific things are, but the basic idea is they detect particles. Um, and it's, it's really cool how they do so. Um, the process, uh, if you have questions about it, is very interesting. Um, I had to do, so I'm working on my prospectus, like I told you, so I had to um, learn a whole lot more about what this guy does, and it is quite interesting. Um, but you can kind of see the size, uh, this, this whole thing, um, so this green out here is actually magnets. They're massive electromagnets um, that keep the, um, all these particles kind of constrained. And uh, they're, it, it's, this thing is huge. So like, I think the, the person here is like actual size. So like, I think this is almost 30 feet tall. Uh, it's a lot. And it's really, really cool. People actually, you know, we actually built this. So this time of flight was actually built by FSU. The rest of this was built by um, other universities that we collaborate with. Um, but this was actually yeah, built at FSU, and then they shipped it up out to uh, Jefferson Labs. Um, so what do I study? I study particle physics. So I want to give you kind of a basic idea. So we have um, an atom. Uh, atoms are made of uh, basically three particles, or three different um, yeah, particles that we know of, elementary particles. You have electrons that kind of float around the outside. You have protons and neutrons on the inside. These, this nucleus here is what I focus on. Um, so I told you we hit uh, photons to hydrogen, right? Hydrogen um, has one proton um, and sometimes one neutron, um, and, but uh, in this case we, we exclude that um, out of our um, reaction um, by doing some, some interesting uh, data analysis. Uh, but yeah, we're able to um, essentially just get reactions where it hits a pro um, the photon hits the proton um, and some really cool things come out. Um, but protons and neutrons are actually made of things. So electron is it's, its own elementary particle, uh, but protons and neutrons actually have um, something inside of them. Uh, we, we didn't know that for a long time um, and, until one experiment um, kind of, uh, it was a very interesting experiment at SLAC that, um, in, in Stanford um, that actually saw that, oh, this thing is made of stuff. So what's it made of? So we have the standard model. This is a very, um, this is, just the particles that come out of the standard model. Um, there's a lot of math that goes into this and why we get this. Um, I've taken uh, three semesters of courses, uh, actually four of courses that talk about where we get all these guys from. Um, it's super interesting what it comes from. But the one I focus on are these quarks here, so these purple guys. Up, down, str charm, strange, top, bottom. Um, and the reason that I focus on those is because uh, protons, neutrons, are hadrons, and they're made up of these quarks. 
Um, they're not the only things made up of quarks. There's actually quite a few different particles. Um, but these quarks are really interesting. Um, they don't like to be alone. They have to be with somebody else. Um, they really like to be close up with um, these other, uh, other quarks. And uh, this glue on here is what holds them together. You can kind of think of the glue on as the spring that's holding two things, um, uh, these, these quarks together. Um, and this glue on is actually very interesting. It gets stronger the further away you go, um, which is uh, opposite to almost all the other forces we talk about. Um, so the further away you go from a point charge, the less you see of it. Um, it's very helpful. Otherwise, we'd, be, we'd have some issues with phones um, and how magnetic fields work. But gluons actually get really strong, almost like a rubber band, the further apart they go. Um, and so it gets even harder and harder to pull them apart. And it's really very special. Um, it's a very special force uh, that this gluon produces. And uh, that's what holds these protons and neutrons together. Um, but because of that, it's very difficult to smash up those things <laughs> because these gluons are really strong. Um, and so I was telling you about, so hadrons um, are made, are, we classify them into two different groups baryons and mesons. Um, baryons are made of three quarks, that's protons, neutrons, and such. And then mesons are made of a quark and anti-quark pair. Uh, we focus on these mesons here at GLUEX because um, uh, we know a bit about baryons and, and we produce a lot of these guys, a lot of these mesons. Um, and so uh, it doesn't show it here, but all these quarks have a anti-quark and all they are, it's just, it's the same um, uh, particle, just a, the opposite charge. So if up is, uh, so it's plus two thirds charge. Um, so then there's a minus two thirds charge and we call that an anti up quark. That's basically what it is. Um, and so, like I said, uh, we focus on these mesons here. Um, and so this right here, so the standard model here d d tells us a lot about all these elementary particles is what we call them. Um, uh, these electrons, you know, all these guys are, um, and then uh, these are called leptons over here, and then these quarks, and then the bosons. But what's important is that um, this standard model is kind of like um, the base. We know that that's kind of what explains everything. The issue is, um, in terms of particle physics, the issue is um, as we get um, at lower energies, so this is really, really true when we get at high energies, um, so things like um, we've got to refer to CERN, um, the Large Hadron Collider. They see these particles. Um, electrons we see in normal basis, but these other ones we don't see a lot. And we definitely don't see quarks, because I told you again, quarks like to be held together. And so we don't see them alone. Um, so what we actually, we have a model of, um, called the quark model. And the quark model explains, this is developed by a couple of really smart guys back um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and they saw that all the particles we were actually seeing made of quarks um, were coming in these two pairs. Um, either they had three of them together or they had two, um, a quark and anti-quark and baryons and mesons. Um, and all the experiments that we were doing, there was a ton of experiments happening in the 70s. We were seeing tons of these uh, different particles and they could all be explained by these two guys. However, this was a simplified model. Um, the standard model actually predicts a, a lot more, a lot more. And we know that this right here, um, because of this, so um, there was the Higgs boson was the last thing it discovered and it was a really big deal. Um, you remember the LHC, it was back in, uh, I think, 2015, 2013, something like that. Um, it was a huge deal. Um, and the reason was is because it kind of confirmed what we, 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 were, we, we thought about the standard model. However, um, the quark model doesn't deal with any of these guys. Um, it just deals with these quarks. And so, but we know that these do things. We know that the gluon does something. Um, we know it's what holds it together. Um, we actually see it in other experiments. So where does it factor into play? Um, and why is it limited to just two and three? Is it, what's going on? Um, and what we see is that the standard model actually predicts other things. It predicts um, uh, particles made of four quarks, particles made of five, um, and even particles that have um, two quarks and a, and a gluon, it's kind of an exotic gluon. Uh, but they, it's very interesting. So the standard model predicts a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't actually see right now or um, that the quark model doesn't, um, doesn't say anything about. And so what we actually care about is this pentaquark state. That's the thing that I'm looking at. Um, so I was telling you about LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Well, they have an experiment called LHCB. B stands is for bottom because they look at the bottom quark. Um, they actually have states they discovered that could be a pentaquark state. They could be states that have these five. 
And what's really important about that is we thought the quark model, we thought that was solid, that was it. But if this pentaquark state is really there, um, then we have to go back to the drawing board in terms of the quark model. We know that this still is the underlying theory. This still is OK. It predicts these guys. But um, we're going to have to add some stuff to what we know, uh, what we use now in, in, uh, in my research, So, um, if that's true. So that's what it's telling you. LHC um, um, did an experiment at CERN in uh, Switzerland. Um, they move particles really fast, and they move protons. So um, electrons are a little easier to move because they're small. Protons are even harder to move because they're massive, right? They're big. They're like 500 times, or they're huge in comparison to the size of the um, electron. Um, and so it's hard to move them. Well, they, uh, and then they smashed them together. They smashed two protons together. It's really interesting. Um, but they actually saw this. So I, I'm not going to explain too much into where this plot's coming from. But what's important here is that, so the mass is on the bottom, and these are histograms. So they tell us an event happened at a specific mass. Um, and what's important is these peaks that we see. So this peak here, this peak here, and this peak here. Um, these peaks tell us that there's more events happening, so more things that we're detecting at that particular mass. Um, and so that's very um, important for us, because that tells us there's probably a particle there, or some kind of state, something happening that is abnormal. Normally, um, so you can see this red curve here. This is um, actually the background. Um, normally, this is what we would see if there was no particles at, um, that are spe specific. Um, but because we see these little peaks here, um, that tells us that there's something there, and something there that's abnormal. Um, and uh, so uh, a couple of theorists, a lot of theorists actually, um, were like, so as an experimentalist, we get some data and we go, I don't really know what this means. Tell me what it means, uh, theorists. And that's what we did, or that's what the LAC did. Um, and so theorists were like, hey, this actually could be possible pentacork states. These, uh, these five here um, together, this could be the case. Um, the reason being, uh, so this gets into some other things. Um, so we look at decays. Uh, so let me see if I can explain um, what decays are. So decays happen because most particles don't live for very long. That's why we don't see them all the time. Protons and neutrons and electrons, they live forever. Um, they, they, do, they have really long lifespans. But um, or, um, yeah, but the uh, most of the particles that we see actually don't, and so because of that, they decay into other things that do live longer. And so in this case, um, the this uh, lambda um, is a baryon, uh, so it's made of three quarks and it actually has a bottom quark in it. That's why the B there is um, is um, short-lived particle. It decays into some other stuff. So this K is a kaon, um, J psi is another particle. That's what's actually important here, and P is proton. So this J psi um, is really, really interesting. Um, it's actually what I'm going to be looking at in my dissertation. Um, so the reason these pentacork states are very interesting um, is because um, of this J psi here. Um, they, again, the quark model doesn't predict them. Um, and they're in a particular channel. Um, and that's a particular decay. Um, and so the basic the moral of the story is they found three things that they, we don't know what they are. Uh, theorists think that that's uh, their pentacork states, but we're not sure. Um, and so to, pr to help um, provide evidence for these states, um, we at GLUEX think we can find those same things. Um, and in fact, theorists have told us that we should, uh, based off of what we know about the standard model, uh, we should see um, those same three states um, in this decay in particular. Uh, so gamma here is a photon hitting a proton. That's what the collision is, right? Um, out comes a proton and a J psi particle, and then that decays into E plus. So this is a positron, electron, and a proton. Um, not super important. The, ba the main point here is that uh, we should see um, three states uh, in this, this chart here. Uh, we actually don't. We don't see any evidence for anything. Um, so there is a steep incline here, but this is a log scale. So if you guys, log scales are a little weird. Uh, we should see, cur we see curves if there's no peaks. Um, if there is, we should see kind of these bumps, kind of like you see here. Um, this is a, the blue line is a theoretical prediction. But we should see something here, and we don't actually see it. Um, this plot here is a, a mass plot. So this really cool, uh, this nice peak here is the JSI particle. That's what this guy is. It's at a little over 3 GeV. Um, the point I, that I want to make is that this right here um, is the first results showing from this particular channel. So J side decaying into electron positron. We should see something that we don't. Um, or we should see something, if this is true, we should see these same three peaks or very similar ones in this plot. 
and we don't. Um, and so why don't we? Well, first, uh, we don't have a, a whole lot of statistics so far. Um, well, we, I do, but we're adding to it. Uh, we've gone, so we have uh, three different run periods, 2017, uh, 2018, um, and 2020. Um, we're actually, uh, we just um, finished 2021, um, and we'll be running again in the end of this year. So we're adding more data that's going to increase these, um, the likelihood that this is true. Um, but the other thing is, is um, so J side decays into E plus E minus like 30% of the time. Um, so uh, this J side particle doesn't live for very long, and the fact that it doesn't means it decays into something else. What does it do? Um, in our case, uh, for a lot of, about 30% of the time, it goes into an electron-positron pair. Um, another 30% of the time, it goes into a muon and anti-muon. So um, uh, muons are another lepton. Um, so if you go back here, muons are here. These are electrons. So half the time, or 30% of the time, it should go to electron and positron pair. The other half is muon, anti-muon. And so that's what I'm going to be looking at. So they've looked at E plus E minus pretty, pretty rigorously. Like, there's like three professors that have worked on this particular channel because um, they really like the result. Uh, they, it's very interesting and uh, very worthwhile. So they've looked at this particular channel. So I'm going to look at a, um, the mu ones and hopefully um, add to the statistics before. And maybe um, with this plot, we can actually start to see little increases where, um, the, where we don't right now. So adding to statistics, being more uh, confirming what we've seen. So I work under the Dr. Sean Dobbs. Um, he is uh, one of three professors that work at, uh, for GLUEX at FSU. Um, he is the, actually he's the head of physics analysis at GLUEX. So he's the head of like 200 people that work there. Um, he knows all the physics going on. All right, really important dude. Um, this again is a mass plot, muons. So we see this uh, right above three, right? Uh, this is that J psi peak. Um, this is actually data I took, or uh, analysis that I did. Um, a lot of the numbers here don't make too much sense. Um, this is a mass. It tells you it's right around 3.1. Um, the width, uh, so this gets into some other interesting things. The width of this, the, it's a ga Gaussian. Have you guys uh, talked about that in statistics? Um, this is actually, you, you care about the standard deviation. That width is that standard deviation of if this was a Gaussian, uh, which gets into a whole lot of other stuff that, uh, <laughs> in, in the analysis side that I uh, don't want to get too much into. But yeah, so we're looking at this decay. This is hopefully what I'll be doing my project on. Hopefully I'll be able to reproduce this um, guy here, but for a different, uh, for instead of J psi to E plus E minus, J psi to mu plus mu minus, um, and uh, help uh, figure out if those states were actually there or they just, um, sometimes they can be um, uh, manufactured um, and it, it, through net data analysis. And so if that's the case, then um, our, our research can help either um, uh, help to um, either support their claim um, or uh, not support it, like in stats, right? support your claims. Um, so that's pretty much uh, my research. I wanted to acknowledge a few people, my wife and my son. So this is my wife, Madeline, and my son, Huxley, um, for supporting me through this. And then also, um, like I said, uh, everyone that's helped me throughout, um, Bodart, Miss Bonnie, Coach uh, Stan, and then um, the professors I've had at Troy, James Sanders, and Dr. Menon, and then my professor at FSU, Dr. Dobbs. Um, it's, I, I can't tell you how important it is to have people uh, with you at each step that are there to, to help you. Um, these are my references for the, the uh, stuff I showed. So uh, thank you guys. Uh, any questions? Um, and also, yeah, oh, this is my contact info if you want to email me about something. Any questions? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. Um, so we see, the, the model says, okay, there's three. Um, in reality, there's actually a ton of them. There's what we call a sea of quarks. Um, but what happens is um, three of them kind of stand out to us. Um, and uh, those three, um, they're all, you're right, they're all connected by these gluons, and that's what's holding the proton together. Um, if it wasn't, if there, those gluons weren't there, they just kind of float apart. Um, and so that's what's bringing them in, um, kind of holding them, uh, kind of like glue. That's what we call a gluon. Um, holding them together, uh, but yeah, you're right. They, you can kind of, um, 
we imagine them to, to be like, we actually draw them as like look, look, little springs because that's what we think they are, um, essentially. Uh, but that's, in reality, um, we, we, we extrapolate a lot of what we think um, is going on in there. And so we're trying to figure that out. Uh, but yeah, good question. Any other questions? About anything, like college, anything. I've been through a lot of life, so please ask. Yeah. Uh, how did you choose what you wanted to research? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, uh, partially out of uh, necessity, I had to. Um, uh, but it was also, um, I knew I was interested in either astrophysics or particle physics. I was going to um, figure it out which one. Um, and then it was based off of who I actually liked the best in terms of professors. Um, I wasn't really picky when it came to what the research was um, in, in those fields, but a very important thing is to pick someone that you like because you're going to be stuck with them for a while, <laughs> um, upwards of six years. Um, some people even take longer than that. So um, if you're, you're in a group for six, seven years, that's a long time, right? Um, you want to make sure that you, you like the people, and that was a big part of it. I really like Sean, um, my professor. I really like the grad students that were in the group. Um, there's, uh, now there's three others. At the time, there was only two, um, Lawrence and Gabriel, and uh, they were really nice, and they helped me a lot. And in fact, a lot of the research I'm doing now, um, I ask them questions, and they're, they're right there. So it's very nice uh, to, to like the people that are in your group, very important part. Yeah. Yes? I don't know It's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw the formula mm -hmm. you're, you're doing. So when I picture you, I picture you like hitting a start button. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. It yeah, it's a very good question. So um, the uh, this the big racetrack, right? It um it pretty well runs uh, continuously for a while. Um, they have people that are working on this thing constantly, um, and so. We essentially go, okay, we're going to start our experiment now, so let electrons in. Um, and so there's this like, yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a switch that actually happens over here. Um, that is basically what it is. Um, it is a little bit more in, uh, complicated in terms of how it works, but uh, basically what it does is it uh, allows the electrons to come through. Um, and so there's also one for halls A, B, and C. Um, and so you can see that um, they can come down this path or they can go around the circle and come back to us. Um, and they, we have these, um, we, they're essentially um, counters, so that way we kind of share the load. If we're both working at the same time, we want to have equal amount of data going to us as well as to them. And so um, they, they are really good at making it, um, splitting that up. But yes, it is a, <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> they, uh, Yes. Oh, my goodness. So this CBAF was built, I think, in the 80s, actually, maybe even earlier than that. They've added to it. Um, that's in Virginia, yep. Sometimes, yeah. So um, this, this year I will go in May, um, at the end of May, uh, for our collaboration meeting. But, yeah, they, so what happens is as students, we just, um, we, we do shifts, um, and so we just sit there and make sure nothing goes wrong. <laughs> um, but essentially, the experiment kind of runs on its own. Um, once we tell the, the CBAF, hey, we need some electrons, um, we, uh, we, we turn on the, the magnets that are really important. We make sure the scintillators are working. Um, there's all, a lot of wires and computers connected to stuff. We just make sure everything is going OK. Um, we really trust the engineers. We also have a lot of engineers that work with us. Um, and it's actually really cool. Uh, these are like, for those of you guys going into engineering, they, these people built this stuff, right? We had a hand in helping them. Um, and, but a lot of the structural things, imagine, so I don't know if you can see this. You see the massive, um, this thing weighs, like this whole thing, he said it weighed like 100 tons. That's a lot of weight. And you have to suspend it because you can't, you can't block the path here, right? Um, and so there's so much going on in terms of engineering um, to hold this thing up. But I don't have to do that. So <laughs> I just sit there and make sure nothing goes wrong. Um, but that's a great question. Yeah, they, uh, there's a lot that goes into that side. That, um, so the experiment is pretty well going. It's built and ready to go. So I haven't actually had to deal with any of the setup. Um, I started like literally the, the summer of COVID. So <laughs> most of, I haven't even gotten to go see it yet. Uh, but um, it's, yeah, they, they do a lot, um, a lot of stuff with it. That's a good question. Though. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. 
How was the transition between like the community college to undergraduate? Yeah. So one of the reasons I went to Troy is because I really liked at Chipola that I could talk to my professors and I could admit people that I actually knew. Um, and so even at FSU now, I'm in, I'm in graduate school and there's, there's 30 people in my class. Um, I talk to maybe like four of them on a regular basis. The campus is so big, um, even within the physics, there's a, uh, the physics building is seven stories tall and I never go above the second story, which is where my, my research, my office is. So I don't get to know those people. And so actually it was really nice to be able to transfer over to, um, to uh, Troy. Um, I will say um, the, really th the thing that helped me a lot actually, I knew what I wanted to go into before I got there. Um, most people at a un big university don't. And um, there was a lot of, I got to know my department really well because of that. Because I already knew going in, I wanted to go into physics and I wanted to go in math. So I hung around those people. <laughs> uh, if you want to go into biology, then you're going to hang around those bio people, right? Um, if, you, if you know your major going in, it's actually really helpful to talk to people. Um, you get to know professors, um, you get to know uh, the people that, um, advisors and stuff like that. Um, and so actually transferring, I think, helped me because I didn't have to, I didn't have to go in with the freshman class, <laughs> basically. Um, the, they're huge, they're, um, it's hard to get to know people unless you're living on campus and you actually get to interact. Um, unless you want to do some stuff on the out, you can do extracurricular stuff that helps. But um, getting to know my department is a big part of actually being able to transfer and it'd be okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> Troy was fun though, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time. There's one other thing I forgot to mention about in the introduction, his introduction, that's the Don, and also last year, I had to go to the hospital for a couple weeks, and he uh, took over my class, my, my two physics classes, and uh, did a really good job, so I'd like to thank him for that. <laughs> and, and if you guys would help me thank him for... Yeah. Do you want to speak to him about